Well, welcome everyone uh, to Landmark's webinar today on the Building Safety Act, what you as property lit litigators uh, need to know now. Uh, thank you all for joining us. Hope you find the presentation uh, useful. Uh, my name is Simon Allison. I'm speaking alongside Aaron Walder uh, this morning. Um, I know uh, from looking at the list, I know a number of you, but not all of you. Uh, I'm a, a junior here at Landmark, uh, and uh, for at least the last five years, an awful lot of my practice has been spent dealing with uh, building safety related issues. Uh, I feel like a semi uh, fire engineer at times and uh, cladding expert, but I try to stick to the law. Um, I'm joined uh, with Aaron um, this morning. Uh, Aaron's a senior junior with 20 years of experience at the Chancery Bar. Uh, he sits as a judge of the uh, first tier tribunal in the property chamber, as indeed do I, but uh, unlike Aaron, he provides training to other judges on the Building Safety Act uh, and he's on the Attorney General's A panel of counsel. Uh, and the great benefit of hearing from Aaron today is he was heavily involved in advising uh, both the policy makers and the draftsmen on the implications of the proposed bill and turning the aims and policy into what became the uh, reality of part five and schedule eight, which is of course what we're looking at today. Uh, so with that, I shall hand over to Aaron. Good morning, everybody. Um, having looked at the list of attendees, it seems tolerably clear to me that most of you know how we ended up with a Building Safety Act in 2022. But I think it is worth quickly revisiting that background uh, just to try and explain how this act ended up being drafted as it did and to fully understand the policy uh, aims uh, behind it. Um, as many of you know, Sir Martin Morbick has recently concluded hearing evidence in stage two of the ongoing public inquiry into the causes of the Grenfell tragedy. Uh, the findings of stage one did not make for pleasant reading for those in the construction industry. Uh, before uh, that inquiry, however, uh, there was uh, a review by uh, Dame Judith Hackett, uh, and she was commissioned to undertake an independent review of building regulations and fire safety. Uh, that review was published in May of 2018. Uh, in summary, uh, the following um, was noted. Now, I won't read that out because it's on your screen, uh, but the politically minded among you uh, will have noted that three bad guys can easily be identified from that uh, statement. Uh, first, uh, the construction industry, large faceless corporations who, the populist view would have us believe, make vast sums of money from a housing market most people think is rigged against them in favour of house builders and landowners. Second, uh, manufacturing companies who make construction products. Again, faceless corporations making a lot of money, uh, and in this situation, specifically identified as cheating the system. Uh, the third bad guy was a little less easy to identify, but the findings were clear. A regulatory system that is not fit for purpose. So whoever was responsible for that regulatory system uh, ought to have charges to answer, shouldn't they? Well, a cynic might suggest that one way of diverting attention from the failings of that regulatory system would be to very loudly and publicly go after the other bad guys in the piece. But whatever the reasoning, there was a lot of political capital at stake. Um, and in reality, of course, there were some vo very real problems that needed addressing that were causing real hardship to ordinary people. Uh, 2018, 2018 to 2020 was a busy time for the UK government, obviously. Um, however, once relieved uh, of his duties as Minister for Preparation for a No-Deal Brexit, the Right Honourable Michael Gove was appointed as Secretary of State for the newly constituted Department of Levelling Up Housing and Communities. Incidentally, he took over from Robert Jenrick, who, after the West Free Development Approval scandal, had become a particular hate figure to the Grenfell United Pressure Group, who considered he was too quick to protect the interests of the property developer and was not listening to their concerns. 
Mr Gove immediately set about his work. Indeed, he was so eager to ensure that he was seen to be tackling this problem seriously and sympathetically against the background of his predecessor's involvement with developers, that in early 2022, which seems quite a long time ago, he made a statement to the House of Commons that no leaseholder living in a building above 11 metres will have to pay to fix dangerous cladding number of quizzical eyebrows were raised at this statement, especially by those who worked in the maintenance and upkeep of residential property. Uh, that is because, uh, as everyone here knows, the usual uh, position in residential leases is that a landlord has the obligation to undertake works of repair and works required by statute or other obligations such as fire safety notices. However, the landlord then has the contractual ability under the lease to recover the cost of those works from the tenant. So was Mr Gove now suggesting that the landlords would still have the contractual obligations to undertake and thus pay for the works, but lose the obligations to recover money from the tenants? Uh, well, yes, he was. Uh, uh, this may seem perfectly fair if the landlord was involved in the original construction of the building and was to blame for erecting the dangerous cladding in the first place. But what about the many other buildings where the freehold had been sold on, in many cases to pension funds holding on to our money, or local authorities with housing obligations, or worse still, to an association of the very tenants who live in the building? One immediate problem was human rights. Uh, under Article 1 of the First Protocol, uh, every natural or legal person is entitled to the peaceful enjoyment of his possessions. If legislation was brought in to the effect that every landlord of every building lost his contractual right to recover the cost of works he was obliged to do, wouldn't that be a breach of the landlord's A1P1 rights? Uh, what about the case of the billionaire who owns a penthouse or a portfolio of flats? Uh, in a block where the freehold has been purchased by a small family pension trust. The tenant is in a far better financial position than the landlord, and the landlord is not blameworthy for the construction of the building, but they would still be obliged to pay anyway. So any legislation would need to find a way to balance both the financial standing of the landlord and the tenant, and also to consider the blameworthy or culpability of a landlord or indeed a number of parties with superior interests in a development. What about managers, commercial managers in a tripartite lease, or ones made up of the very tenants the scheme sets out to protect? What about enfranchised blocks where the tenant doubles as the landlord? As you can all see, a straightforward and meritorious policy can collide very quickly with the intricacies of the UK residential property system. Leaving aside the current system and the market, uh, a second problem was the law as it currently stood, including limitation periods. Previously, it had been very unlikely that a cause of action under, for example, the Defective Premises Act, or under the original build contract, could be bought by current occupiers because of the passage of time before any defect made itself apparent. Further, in tort, negligence, for example, it's not possible to receive a remedy for pure economic loss, except in very limited circumstances. Uh, a claim that a building has been built negligently, and as such, the owner has to pay to remediate that defect is clearly pure economic loss. Um, uh, and uh, that was clarified in the case of Sports City for Management and others versus Countryside Properties in 2020. So against these very real concerns, both in a legal sense and a moral sense, the Building Safety Act was drafted and received royal assent on the 28th of April 2022, just over uh, eight uh, months ago. It is a behemoth of an act containing no less than 171 sections and 10 schedules. However, for the property litigator, Part 5 and Schedule 8 is where the real interest is. I want you to try and keep in mind the original aims of the Act as set out by Mr Gove, and also the difficulties that his approach may cause and how the Act tries to address those. 
first of all, commencement. By section 170, sections 116 to 125 and schedule eight, which are the provisions we will be concentrating on, came into effect two months after the act uh, was passed, meaning they are, of course, already uh, in uh, force. Uh, some of those uh, relevant sections require the Sec Secretary of State to make regulations, uh, and we already have some of those regulations. Some of the drafting of those regulations causes uh, the quizzical eyebrow to raise uh, further. So who does this act apply to? Uh, part five of the act states that 100, uh, section 117 to 125 make provisions in connection with the remediation of relevant defects in relevant buildings. So we've got a lot of specific definitions to consider. There is a relevant building, there is a qualifying lease, there is the qualifying time, there are relevant defects, and then there are the concept of associates. We have protection for tenants in respect of costs connected with relevant defects, and we have the new concept of a remediation order. So a relevant building is one which is at least 11 metres high, contains at least two uh, dwellings. Um, and so the first point to note is that tenant protection provisions do not apply to buildings under that height. A relevant building does not include one where the tenant's right of first refusal has been exercised, Collective enfranchisement has been exercised or where the freehold uh, estate is leaseholder owned. So there is no protection offered by the Act where the tenants own the building or the land. A leaseholder owns a qualifying lease if it is a long lease of a single dwelling with an obligation to pay service charge. Try and remember this definition because we'll be revisiting it in a bit later. However, as at February 14th, 2022, the leaseholder must live in the property as their only principal home or not own another dwelling in the UK or own no more than two other dwellings. Clearly this is intended to rule out our billionaire and our investor who owns a portfolio of flats that are rented out on ASTs. However, why do they allow two other dwellings? Frankly, who knows? Now, the slightly more interesting bit, uh, which defects does the Act apply to? Section 122a and b say it's a a relevant defect is anything that arises out of anything done or not done, used or not used, and causes a building safety risk. Section 123 continues that it must be in connection with works relating to the construction or conversion of the building, or in connection with works done or commissioned by a relevant landlord within the last 30 years or after that period, work's done to remedy a relevant defect. On the face of it, therefore, this is very wide ranging, construction or conversion of the building, any work's done in the last 30 years or any works at all to remedy a defect. However, the key limiting factor is, they, is that they must cause a building safety risk. Think for a moment about a dispute regarding the replacement of a roof. To a property practitioner, this is a common enough issue. The tenant is experiencing water ingress. Expert reports say the roof needs replacing. There's an argument about who should pay. On the face of this section, the roof is work relating to the construction of the building. But is it a relevant defect attracting the protection of the Act? In the early draft of the bill, 
the requirement of a building safety risk wasn't there. It applied to any defect at all. However, now a building safety risk means a risk to the safety of people, not property, mind you, arising from the spread of fire or the collapse of any building or any part of it. So does our roof fall into this category? Is the damage sufficient that it might collapse and cause a risk to the safety of people in the building? Well, if so, then yes, it, it appears to be. So what protection does the Act actually afford? What happens if the Act does apply to our building and to our lease and our defect amounts to a building safety risk? Section 122 of the Act states Schedule 8 provides certain service charges amounts relating to the relevant defect in a relevant building are not payable and furthermore makes provision for the recovery of remediation costs from the landlord. Schedule 8 is where we get to the real uh, meat of this legislation. Uh, I very much suspect institutional landlords jaws hit the floor when they first saw this. In summary, firstly, no service charge is payable under a qualifying lease in respect of cladding remediation. That's it. Simple, clear and effective. If the Act applies, the landlord cannot recover from the tenant the cost of removal or remediation of cladding. But what exactly is cladding remediation? Well, the Act tells us uh, it forms the uh, outer wall uh, and is unsafe. Well, clearly that's not going to cause any issues then, is it? There are also a number of other situations where the landlord is prevented from recovering service charge. The other paragraphs of the schedule give situations where no service charge is payable under a qualifying lease in respect to a relevant measure relating to any relevant defect. Pausing there, what is a relevant measure relating to a relevant defect? We've discussed uh, relevant defects. But what about a relevant measure? Well, uh, that is defined as a measure to remedy the defect or for the purposes of preventing a risk from materialising or reducing the severity of any relevant risk. To unpack that, Assuming the defect is in relation to AOVs, which are automatic opening valve windows and roof vents. Um, for those that don't know, and I didn't until I had a case about them, these amount to a fire safety system in that basically they are supposed to open in the event of a fire to dissipate smoke for uh, resident safety. So if they were not operating as they should, that would be a relevant defect because they are used in relation to the construction of the building, or if they were put in later, they are used in connection with works undertaken by the landlord. The fact that they are not working amounts to a risk to the safety of people from the spread of fire. Same issue could occur for wooden balconies, for example. They could easily be a relevant defect if the evidence suggested their presence caused a risk. But it is not simply the remedial costs the Act deals, deals with, it's also any relevant measure. A waking watch, for example, is specifically for the purpose of reducing the severity of any fire, should one occur while the defect to the AOV windows or the balconies remains unremediated. So cases relating to wooden balconies or AOV windows, not only would the landlord be unable to recover the cost of the remediation, which could well amount to full replacement, they would also be unable to recover the cost of any relevant measures relating to it. Uh, this bar uh, on the recovery of service charge for relevant measures relating to relevant defect doesn't take effect in all circumstances, like the bar on recovery for cladding remediation however. Um, it, it does arise in a number of scenarios, and those scenarios are all based on the status of the landlord. 
Category one is pretty uncontroversial. It's where the landlord or an associate of the landlord is responsible for the defect. The reference to para two in the slide refers to the paragraph in Schedule 8 where the categories are set out. Uh, I suspect there will be much litigation about how to tell if the landlord is actually responsible uh, and what an associate amounts to, but that may well be beyond the scope of this talk and may be a matter for company lawyers. Uh, one point worth noting, which either shows this measure is designed with the censure of rogue builders in mind, or was an oversight, I don't know, is that paragraph two of schedule eight, which defines this category of landlord as one who cannot recover service charges, states that it applies in relation to a lease of any premises in a relevant building. Unlike the other paragraphs of the schedule, it does not specifically refer to a qualifying lease, which is the definition of which I mentioned we'd come back to. So on the face of it, the advantage of this prohibition can be relied upon by someone who does hold the portfolio of flats. In fact, it could even be used by the commercial tenant in a multi-use building to avoid paying its service charge. Developer landlords, watch out. The second category is much more controversial. Remember, this will, ar this will only arise when the landlord is specifically not responsible for the defect in the first place. Uh, it's described as where the landlord meets the contribution condition. In other words, it's how wealthy the landlord is. It will involve findings of fact on a landlord's group net worth, big pun, uh, which in turn involves determining how many buildings the landlord and any associate pers person is the landlord of. Note, not how many freeholds it owns, but how many it is the landlord of. The number of holdings is multiplied by 2 million. And if the landlord has a greater net worth than that, no service charge is payable. Now, how the tenants are supposed to gather the evidence of how many buildings the landlord or any associated company has a reversionary interest in, and indeed what the company's net worth figure actually is, so as to prove they meet the contribution uh, condition, is something we shall have to wait and see. Uh, the Final situation um, where no service charge is payable is where the flats are worth below a certain figure, 325,000 in Greater London, 175,000 out of it. Uh, Schedule A also sets a cap on the amount of service charges that can be charged even if the landlord does not fall into any of those above categories uh, and the leases are, are worth more. Um, than the prescribed um, minimum. So uh, in summary, the intention is that developer landlords and wealthy landlords will never be able to recover costs for repairing relevant defects from tenants. Tenants who purchase their properties for a relatively low sum will never have to pay for relevant defects, irrespective of who their landlord is and no landlord will be able to recover the full remedial cost as a service charge because there's a cap on the total that can be recovered each year. And that's how the Act works, and it's in full force already. Um, some issues uh, to consider uh, for the future. What do the regulations say? Uh, are they clear? Um, do they uh, allow more or, or fewer uh, issues to arise? And do they clarify any of the uh, opaque uh, elements uh, of the Act? Is Schedule A retrospective in effect? Could the effect of this Act benefit a class of tenants who were never intended to be alleviated of their obligations to pay for repairs? And how will the mortgage markets, the ground rent freehold markets and the housing markets react to this change of burden implied by imposed by legislation? Finally, will the first tier tribunal be able to cope with the considerable increase of work it, that was going to be coming their way? Um, to um, consider uh, those issues and more, uh, I'm now going to hand back to Simon Ellison. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Aaron. <clears throat> so that there is the framework. Um, part five and schedule eight sadly leave a, 
a huge number of issues unanswered, which raises lots of interesting questions for us lawyers, but of course that should be a concern uh, for our clients uh, because it would suggest that it's not achieving, uh, it's, it's potentially not going to achieve what the government sets out to do in terms of protecting leaseholders and potentially oversteps the mark in terms of the impact on other parties. We shall see. Uh, that might be a byproduct of trying to rush through very complex legislation in a matter of weeks, but uh, what do I know? What I, what I can say is that we now have a number of sets of regulations. It's beyond the scope of this talk to run through all the regulations in, in any detail. But for your reference, the relevant ones are the Building Safety Leaseholder Protections Information England Regulations 2022 and the Building Safety Leaseholder Protections England Regulations 2022. Uh, and I'll, I'll touch on them briefly in a moment on a few particular points. Uh, the regulations do aim to fill some gaps, but they don't do that particularly satisfactorily. Um, uh, and indeed, I'm aware of several judicial review cases pending. Aaron and I are against each other in an already running judicial review into the lawfulness of the regulations. And it seems that these regulations may well need to be amended. Uh, so make sure you're looking at an up to date version if you come to look at this at some point next year. So I wanted to highlight some examples of areas of the Act that are particularly unclear and that I think are likely to arise in the course of our uh, building safety practices over the uh, next 12 months. And then I'm going to turn to touch on remediation orders and remediation contribution orders, and then we'll hopefully get some uh, questions. I can see a number of questions are already coming in. Um, the first unresolved problem to have on your radar is what is the extent of a relevant defect and uh, a building safety risk. So Aaron's just taken you through uh, section 120, which I'm sure you'll remember very clearly indeed. Um, <clears throat> so a relevant defect is a defect that arises as a result of something done or not done, anything used or not used in connection with relevant works and causes a building safety risk. And a building safety risk was a risk to the safety of people in or about the building arising from the spread of fire or the collapse of the building. It's a potentially very wide um, definition, even with the introduction of the uh, building safety risk um, requirement that Aaron, uh, that Aaron was, was uh, talking about. Because the question is how small a part of a building must be at risk of a collapse as a result of something done not done or used or not used. So I've been looking at, for example, a case where uh, the issue is uh, panes of glass that spontaneously um, are shattering. Well, if a pane of glass shatters, is that a collapse? Is it a collapse of part of the building? Is that really what was intended to be caught? And also, uh, in other contexts, you know, uh, building safety risk is a risk to the safety of people arising from the spread of fire. Well, how much risk? does it need to be if it's going to be caught by that definition? What if an ancillary benefit of the works you are doing is a reduction in risk, but it also needed to be undertaken for other reasons? And of course, the relevance of this is that if it can be, if a set of works that a landlord or a manager undertakes can be shoehorned into the definition of relevant defect, then nothing's going to be payable if you have the benefit of the protections, which will apply to most residential leaseholders. So there is the risk that works that were never intended really to be caught by the definition of section 120 of the Act actually catch a number of other um, types of works, you know, not, not just the, the classic you know, uh, remediation of cladding and dealing with compartmentation issues. What about other works? So that's going to be something that people will inevitably be pushing the envelope of and, and trying to see how far it goes. And, it's worth bearing in mind that section 120 covers not just works that were undertaken in the past but also works undertaken in the future to remedy a relevant defect so if you shoddily um, remedy a relevant defect then it will also um, that the relevant works can also be um, those works that you've undertaken to remedy the relevant defects. So that might impact upon warranties sought from contractors and you need to be clear whether the works you're doing are works to remedy a relevant defect. So that's, that's the first issue. 
Um, then we come to, as, as um, Aaron mentioned, the question of whether the effect of Schedule 8 is retrospective. This has potentially huge ramifications for those landlords who did the right thing, as the government called it in the early days, and got on and remediated and um, issued, issued demands and incurred costs. Uh, now, Michael Gove uh, would like everyone to think Schedule 8 is retrospective. He wrote a letter uh, to the uh, TPI and the BPF on the 27th of June this year, uh, it's a letter that's published on the government's website, and you might think, well, uh, you know, it's just a, a letter to some industry bodies, but actually the purpose of this letter wasn't really to write to those bodies, as far as I can tell. It was to have a letter that uh, will then be pushed out to leaseholders to say, look, this is what we're telling to people, and it's referred to in all of the government's guidance. Um, and the particular bit that it's worth noting in that letter is this, uh, he says, uh, the law as it previously stood allowed your members to charge all leaseholders for the full cost of all necessary remediation work. Pausing there, not quite right. Uh, but that's led to a situation where managing agents and freeholders are sending people invoices for hundreds of thousands of pounds at the bankrupt families and leave leaseholders facing financial ruin. Those days are now over and the act means qualifying leaseholders can thankfully dispose of these invoices. So the implication in that letter is that if you have a demand that's outstanding from a couple of years ago, you can now uh, tear it up. Uh, and uh, sorry, the, then the bottom bit uh, you can see in bold, it's important to be clear from tomorrow, anyone who chooses to breach the statutory protections will be committed criminal offence and could face 10 years in prison. Well, of course, um, that would have been of great concern, uh, particularly to managing agents who are being asked by their clients to carry on issuing demands for works that had been undertaken before the act was brought into force, um, you know, for balancing charges or whatever for that year's service charge. Uh, what do we think about that? Well, the first thing to note is, of course, no criminal offence is actually created by the Building Safety Acts in respect of this. Uh, I think the widespread assumption is that the reference in there is to the Fraud Act 2006. So obviously you should not be issuing demands for service charges that you know are not payable. Uh, that has always been uh, the law and that continues to be the law. But I think, I think really that's as far as that goes. Um, but back to the real question, can existing service charge demands be torn up? Uh, to be brutally honest, the answer is we don't know until the point is litigated. The government clearly, or at least uh, Mr Gove clearly thinks it, it can do. However, I, I'm not so sure. Um, the first thing to note is where the Act intends its effect to be retrospective, it expressly says so. And if you look at section 1353, that's a provision that amends the Limitation Act uh, in respect of uh, DPA claims, takes it back a long way. It expressly says this provision should be read as if it has always been in force. That's not there in Schedule 8 and Part 5. Um, why should there be a distinction between demands that were sent last year which have been paid or have been admitted and those that have not been paid? Are we saying protection is only there for the people who didn't pay their bills, but is, uh, but uh, you know, if you did pay it and you admitted the sum, then that's that, because the tribunal can't go back and look at whether something is payable if it's already been admitted. Um, so that that seems to uh, that would be a weird distinction to make between leaseholders who have paid and haven't paid. And what we don't know is, does it matter when the costs were incurred? Can you have incurred costs before the act came into force, but demand them afterwards? Or will the cutoff point be whether you demanded prior to the act coming into force? It all comes down to when these sums are assessed as being payable, because, of course, you can apply to the tribunal under Section 27A for a determination whether a service charge is payable. Well, do you assess whether it was payable at the point when the demand was issued or at the point when the application is being determined? And of course, the law may differ at those two points in time, depending on which side of the 28th of June this year they fall. Uh, and, and finally, of course, if it is retrospective, well, how far back do we go? Because there's nothing to say it's only for the last five years or for the last 12 months. 
um, there's no limitation period applicable to a Section 27A application. So if it's retrospective, are we potentially facing uh, applications uh, to the tribunal for a determination as to the payability of works to install a, I don't know, a fire alarm system in 2010 or something? Um, so I, I think uh, certainly my preliminary view on this is, uh, no, it's not. Uh, retrospective, but uh, it's going to be a key point that at least uh, one party, and if not many parties, are going to have to litigate in the near future if they haven't already, and I suspect we'll see an appeal in the upper tribunal on this point fairly soon. Another point is what's the extent of uh, cladding remediation? Uh, you'll recall um, Aaron took us through uh, paragraph 8.2 of, of Schedule 8, and there's the definition of cladding remediation. Well, what bits behind the facade are part of a system? Brick walls are cladding, uh, but is the insulation behind that, behind a brick wall part of the system where you've got a, a brick outer leaf and then you've got uh, combustible potentially insulation behind that? Is that a system or is that just a way of building a wall? Um, I think we all think of a cladding system as being the classic, you know, sort of uh, metal or laminate panels and then rails and everything behind it with insulation in between. But um, the precise extent of the cladding system, we don't know. The next issue, uh, how do RMCs and RTM companies progress remediation? I'm posing that question in the context of a, a sort of tripartite arrangement. Obviously, if you've got a situation where it's an RMC that owns the freehold and manages its own uh, building, then they're not caught as things stand uh, by these provisions because they're excluded. Um, see back to Aaron's earlier slides. But where you've got an RMC as a named manager, but they're not the freeholder, or you've got an RTM company in place, they have the liability in most instances to um, remediate. They usually have the obligation to comply with statutory requirements. They usually have the obligations to keep in repair and, and, and all the rest of it. So they are the party responsible for remediating uh, under the lease. They cannot recharge their costs to their leaseholders because um, they are bound by Schedule 8 and paragraph 10 of Schedule 8, uh, but that's their sole income source, unless they can get someone else like the freeholder or the developer to pay. So what, what do they do? Now, uh, you'll see paragraph 10 of Schedule 8 says, um, make some provision for um, them not be able to recharge the costs. And you'll see in the regulations uh, that it sets out in various paragraphs, this is in the uh, leaseholder protections information regulations, how to get some money from other people uh, if you can't pay. And so there's express provision in there for uh, an RMC company be able to give notice to a landlord and make the landlord pay, even though the landlord isn't the party with the um, responsibility under the lease. So what they do is they give notice and they demand a contribution from the uh, responsible landlord. But how do they know the cost of remediation? How do they know how much they want the landlord to, to um, pay? Uh, and the real difficulty in these cases is that it often takes tens of thousands of pounds worth of professional input to work out what the defects are, what needs to be done, and therefore how much it's going to cost. Um, and on the regulations as currently drafted, it's not at all clear that they can give notice to the landlord saying, we want you to give us a sum of money so we can go away and investigate things. So they're in a potentially difficult position, particularly where the works are not works which will be covered by the Building Safety Fund. Um, so that's something to be worked through, but I do think RMCs are in a particularly difficult position at the moment. I could go on with many, many other unresolved issues. I'm just going to touch on a on a few. Um, there is an issue about how the landlord establishes if it meets the contribution condition. So the contribution condition is the, uh, you'll recall Aaron was uh, mentioning the £2 million per building calculation. You work out if the landlord's net 
worth is higher or lower than 2 million times the number of buildings. Uh, there is, uh, in the regulations, it sets out how you calculate the uh, net worth of the landlord's group. But that group is, of course, global. There may be very little visibility of a uh, subsidiary in this country over the full uh, group uh, net worth, as an example. There may not be published accounts. Um, that also makes it, of course, very difficult, looking on the other side, for leaseholders to challenge a landlord certificate. The next one is how late can a leaseholder provide a leaseholder certificate? So this is the other side. So you've got the landlord certificate that deals with the landlord's contribution condition. And the default is if the landlord doesn't give a certificate, then they are deemed to um, meets the contribution condition. Leaseholders, on the other hand, um, have the have the inverse in that the leaseholder certificates, uh, unless a landlord takes the relevant steps to obtain a leaseholder certificate from a leaseholder, they are assumed to have the protection. And under the regulations, landlords are all expected to have served uh, notice on leaseholders to obtain a um, a certificate from leaseholders as to their um, their position and whether they have the protection that's got a leaseholder deed of certificate and there's a whole load of steps landlords have to take within five days of becoming aware of a um, defect in the building. The effect of that, of course, was that as at the date when these regulations came in, there was a five day window for everyone to scrabble around and serve tens of thousands of notices on leaseholders which is completely unachievable. And I know managing agents are tearing their hair out trying to get this all done. The point is you serve notice on the leaseholders. There's a period of roughly three months it takes to get these certificates. But if they don't provide it, the leaseholder does not have the protection under the Act. However, it seems to me that uh, potentially the leaseholder could provide it late, even at the door of the court, when you're getting a determination as to payability and still benefit from the protections. But quite whether a leaseholder can remedy it that late, and if so, how late is something that is yet to be worked out. And then we've got the practical points. Um, I mean, I've already said how a managing agent is going to cope with all this in terms of obtaining the certificates. It seems to me there may be an impact upon management fees. Um, which could go up because managing agents are going to have so much more work to do in affected uh, blocks in terms of getting these certificates in, doing the chasing, so on and so forth. But they've also got a big headache because one of the protections in Schedule 8 is um, that there's a cap on the amount that can be recovered um, if none of the other protections kick in. There's a cap based on the expenditure over the five-year period prior to the Act coming into force. Well, of course, on most developments, the accounts aren't split out into uh, works that are potentially caught by Schedule 8 and works that are not. So there is an accounting task to be gone through on many developments just to work out whether or not the cap exists and if not, how much remains to be caught. So uh, lots of headaches for uh, managing agents. So does all this work? Well, the intention was to protect leaseholders from having to pay for remediation and ensure the polluter pays. It does achieve that, I think, um, in terms of protecting leaseholders. I'm not sure it achieves the ensuring the polluter pays bit yet, but we're going to come on to look at remediation orders and remediation contribution orders. The reason I say that is the effect of Schedule 8 and Part 5 is just to protect leaseholders and shove it on to landlords but of course, landlords are not, unless they're tied up with the developer, the polluter. Uh, so there's a second bit that is yet to be worked, worked through. And then it was also really to continue to up the pace of building safety remediation. And of course, what's actually happened is it's caused a huge amount of uncertainty. And a lot of building safety remediation has really paused. There's a building safety fund in place that I'm sure most of you are aware of that's officially operating. But as I understand it, very little is happening and people are working out what happens under the Building Safety Act alongside the Building Safety Fund, alongside something called the Developer Pledge. And the Developer Pledge is something that we are told 49 developers have signed up to and promised that they will remediate any buildings that have issues that they built in the last 30 years. 
but that currently isn't a thing. So people are waiting for the developers to sign up to some form of legally binding commitment. The BSF fund isn't paying out on anything where the developers are expected to pay. Landlords, meanwhile, are stuck, uh, unsure whether the grant funding agreement under the Building Safety Fund uh, is suitable anymore. And we're in a general state of paralysis. Lots of issues there that I can't fully go into for those of you not familiar with all the uh, Building Safety Fund issues. But um, the long and the short of it is remediation is pausing in some instances, and that uh, has a, a negative impact, of course, for um, leaseholders in particular, um, and is causing a degree of frustration. And that is resulting in um, the government um, now pushing on to look at something called remediation orders. So um, the Department for Leveling Up uh, via its Recovery Strategy Unit has uh, just issued, in fact, some applications to remediation orders in respect of a number of buildings. And it's threatening to apply for something called a remediation contribution order in other cases. So let's look at what that is, because to the extent things are stalling, the government's way of keeping things going is to keep uh, uh, try, trying to force landlords into getting on with uh getting on with remediation projects um oh go back so i think a remediation order and remediation contribution order applications i think they're going to become very common in the ftt and over the next 12 months i hope they're ready for what's coming because i think it's going to be a key battleground and the key thing to note with these is that whilst the secretary of state can apply as an interested person in the main i think these are going to be brought by parties to the lease they're easy applications to issue uh, and um, we'll see how easy they are to progress to a successful outcome. But certainly leaseholders who are getting frustrated about the lack of progress, they can they can issue very quickly an application to force uh, the relevant uh, landlord to, to get on with remediation. And um, one can see that many leaseholders are going to be pretty frustrated at this point after a number of years probably very little happening so that's why i think these applications are going to become pretty common let's look at remediation orders first they're under section 123 uh, so it's an order made by the ftt on the application of an interested person requiring a relevant landlord to remedy specified relevant defects in a specified relevant building by a specified time so lots of relevant and specified um, the relevant landlord is going to be the landlord under a lease of the building or any part of it who is required under the lease or by virtue of an enactment to repair or maintain anything relating to the relevant defect so if you've got a, a situation with a number of um you know we've got a lease um the freeholder head lease subhead lease then the residential leases it's going to be the party in that chain uh, who has the obligation to repair or maintain anything re relating to the relevant defects so if it's the structure it'll be the party that does the structure that's responsible for the structure under the scheme uh, that is the relevant landlord it may be that the relevant landlord in respect of the uh, cladding is different from the relevant landlord in respect of uh, for example compartmentation issues fire doors and things internally because you'll often find in a headley situation one landlord is responsible for the internal parts and another is responsible for the structure. And I think I saw before I started speaking a question along those lines. I think potentially you could have multiple relevant landlords in respect to something because sometimes the repairing obligation doesn't tie up with the statutory compliance obligation or you have multiple parties with liability for statutory compliance. So that, that'll be interesting to see how that works out. Now, that reference to landlords also includes managers in tripartite leases. So where you've got a tripartite lease, managers responsible for uh, providing the services, they will be treated as a relevant landlord. Who can apply? Uh, they're described as an interested person. That's section 1235. So it's the regulator as created by the Act, uh, local authority, fire and rescue authority, and then I've highlighted this, a person with a legal or equitable interest in the relevant building or any part of it. Uh, so any leaseholder can apply. Um, 
it seems to me that in theory a commercial tenant could also apply so long as they have a legal or equitable interest in the building they've got a mixed use building um and and that's going to be i think the key um the key category of person who will be applying uh, and then any other person prescribed by regulations um the regulations have uh, hurriedly uh, secured that the Secretary of State is an interested person just in time for the Secretary of State to issue his first applications. I suspect that was a mistake in terms of not including the Secretary of State in there in the first place. How do you apply? Uh, so there's a short form. I've included the link on the slides and the slides will be coming round to you. There's no fee and you just file it at the first tier tribunal uh, property chamber. You will have to specify the relevant landlord. I don't know if you can specify more than one relevant landlord, that remains to be seen. You need to set out the defects, the reasons why you think an order should be made and set out what order you seek. I think they're looking for a draft order. Um, you'll then get case management directions given in the usual way, providing for statements of case, provision of all the documents on which you rely, a statement of case in reply. And I suspect in many of these cases um, where there's a dispute about the extent of works or whether indeed works are required at all, we'll then have to have provision for expert reports. So it's going to follow, we anticipate, a fairly uh, usual course in, for a first tier tribunal application. I anticipate um, they will be keen to get uh, keep the pace up. So I expect directions will have a fairly ambitious timetable uh, once these become a bit more routine. Here's a few strange things about section one, two, three. When you look at it, you'll note it doesn't actually give the first tier tribunal any power to make a remediation order. Uh, I go back to the hurried nature of uh, the legislation. There is now a regulation two sub two of the building safety leaseholder protections information regs, which says the first tier tribunal may on an application make a remediation order. It also doesn't give us any guidance, any test as to when an order should or should not be made. So it's going to have to be worked out on a case by case basis. Uh, as I say, the FTT may make a remediation order. There is no guidance on it, so it seems it's an open ended. Uh, discretion. So we don't know until we see a few of these working their way through uh, when a remediation order is or is not appropriate, uh, how the FTT is going to distinguish between potentially multiple parties who might be the subject of a remediation order where we have that. Um, and of course, the order's got to specify relevant defects to be remedied. So you must know what the defects are first with sufficient clarity to be able to specify what defects must be remedied. So that's going to be a bit of a challenge for people bringing these applications is the need to evidence what the defects are. You don't need to specify, as I understand it, uh, precisely what works must be done. You have to specify the defects to be remedied. Uh, and it's worth noting that if you don't comply with a remediation order, it can be enforced with the permission of the county court in the same way as an order of that court. So there is an enforcement uh, mechanism. So the final thing I'm going to touch on, uh, and then we'll get to some questions, is section 124 of the Building Safety Act, which deals with remediation contribution orders. Uh, you can see on the slide there, it's a, an order requiring a specified body corporate or partnership so pausing there, not an individual, to make payments to a specified person for the purpose of meeting costs incurred or to be incurred in remedying relevant defects or specified relevant defects re relating to the relevant building. So the parties that can be specified are either the landlord or the person who was the landlord on the 14th of February 2022, that's the qualifying time, or a developer, or a person associated with a person within any of those categories. Just pausing there, the key reason a landlord's going to be specified as the party who should pay under remediation contribution orders is potentially where you've got RMCs and RTM companies and they want to find uh, a, a way of making the landlord pay. There are other ways of them doing it, but I can see they may apply for an RCO. Uh, but equally, I think the chief reason RCOs will be applied for is in respect of getting developers to pay. Uh, 
and it doesn't need to be you know often the developer in respect to the large development will be an spv but the definition of associated with is extremely wide if you look at section 121 so uh, there is definitely the potential to go against the developer in many cases um, and get the developer to contribute towards the cost of remediating if not covering the entire cost um, so I think we're going to see because you can go against the developer and get money from the, the developer and the group companies I think we're likely to see landlords and managers who are subject to remediation order applications issuing an application for remediation contribution order potentially against multiple parties as a cross application because what they will want to do is well they'll, they'll be thinking well if I'm going to be ordered to pay so if I'm going to be ordered to carry out these works I want someone else to pay for it and the someone else is the person who actually caused the problem because it wasn't me that's going to be the logic. Um, if you look at the uh, definition of uh, developer in section 1245, he says, scrolling down, 1245 developer in relation to a relevant building means a person who undertook or commissioned the construction or conversion of the building with a view to grant your disposing interests in the building. So it's either the party who undertook it or it's the party who, who commissioned the work. So you've got multiple parties who might be a developer. And then amongst those definitions of developer, you've got all the people who are associated with, which is in section 121. So there's a wide category of people that might be subject to these remediation contribution orders. Uh, and um, that means potentially there's going to be a large number of parties who can be subject to them. And the tribunal is going to have to decide if it is going to make a remediation contribution order, who should pay. And it's also going to have to work out in what proportions will all these parties, if there's multiple parties um, subject to the application, which of them should pay. And of course, we might get more cross applications where one developer is named and they say, well, we want the contractor um, to be brought in or, or whatever, if they meet the relevant definition. So it could be quite messy. Uh, it's a similar process for applying. I'll put the link for the form on there. Again, no, no fee. You have to specify the sum that you seek. Uh, it's a similar list of interested persons who can apply. Um, we do get some guidance as to when the FTT should make one of these orders. They say the FTT may make an order if it considers it just and equitable to do so. Now, um, that's it. That's all the that's all the guidance you get. But the concept of it of just and equitable isn't completely unknown to those of us who uh, do this sort of work. You'll recall section 20C orders, which are orders where the tribunal can prevent the landlord from recovering via the service charge, the costs of the proceedings. They can be made where it's just and equitable to do so. And there is a bit of case law on that. So some of that might be able to be brought in by analogy uh, to give us some, some clues. But um, the just and equitable test will also be the test to decide as between multiple potential pain parties. And again, we're going to, have to see how these cases all work their way through. Um, and the order can require payments of a specified amount or payments of a reasonable amount in respect to the remediation of specified relevant defects. So uh, it may be works that have been done or works that will be done. And the order can be one that requires the sums to be made on demand following the occurrence of a specified event. So it might be that the payments have to be made on the signing of a JCT contract, as an example. Um, as I say, potential for multiple cross applications. I think there's going to be tactical considerations in terms of time. You're going to want all these applications heard together usually. That means you're going to have to act swiftly. If you're acting for a landlord that's subject to a remediation order and the landlord wants to make a an RCO application to get someone else to pay for it, you need to get on with that fairly quickly because otherwise if the directions don't tie up and you're delaying the making of a remediation order, the, the tribunal in the exercise of its sort of case management discretion may be reluctant to um, delay things. If, you've, if you haven't got a good reason for delaying issuing your RCO application, I think um, potentially going to run separately from each other. Uh, and the final thing is, of course, don't forget it's a no-cost jurisdiction. Uh, so on the upside, 
especially for leaseholders, less adverse costs risk. It's going to be cheap. It's going to be quicker uh, to pursue remediation. It's going to be much, much cheaper and quicker than, uh, you know, a case in the TCC, for example, pursuing a developer to, to pay. So if you're a landlord and you want the developer to pay, uh, and particularly if it's a developer that's signed up to this developer pledge but hasn't actually got on with it, I think the FTT is going to be quite sympathetic. Whereas pursuing the developer in the TCC where you haven't got all these associated with definitions is always going to be more risky. Downside is you've got to cover your own costs and that will go for RMCs and RTM companies as well. Uh, and of course, leasehold is going to see this as a way to put pressure on the landlord uh, quite rightly. So that's why I think they will be issuing some of these applications. And I, I know some already have. Aaron, where are we on, on questions? Uh, well, thank you, Simon. Um, uh, for, first of all, uh, thank you. We've, we've got um, a lot of questions. Um, uh, I will deal with a couple um, first uh, and then um, uh, we'll ha have a chance to look through uh, some of them again. Uh, I just wanted to make one addition about this point uh, about associates, because it is something that is a theme running through the Act. The uh, fear uh, of uh, the department uh, was uh, exactly as highlighted uh, by Simon, that many developers are SPVs, uh, um, companies of straw, uh, uh, won't be able to have any liability. And they specifically wanted to be able to get behind that. And the basis of thinking was, uh, if anyone has any experience of this, um, the Petroleum Act uh, and various uh, legislation involving environmental uh, damage where uh, exactly the same situation happens. So uh, should anyone find themselves in a very complex uh, argument about what exactly is meant by an associate, there, there may be some help in, in looking at um, environmental damage and environmental issues, because uh, that was the legislative basis that the department was considering when trying to, in effect, pierce the corporate veil and go behind the SPVs um, that are responsible for developing um, hazardous buildings, frankly. So um, looking at the questions uh, we have, uh, I'm going to take the first uh, two that were asked because the themes that I will be bringing up in, those, in answering those two questions have been asked in a couple of other questions uh, further down. So the first question is pretty straightforwardly um, from Philip Copley. Um, the Building Safety Act deals with cladding for residential tenants, but what about commercial tenants potentially being hit with significant service charge demands for cladding remediation? Well, uh, the Act does not interfere with normal contractual obligations except where it says it does. So, question one, is the building a relevant building? Is it over five stories or over 11 metres high? Uh, and I note somebody did ask whether it had to be both. No, they're either raw. Um, so if it is five stories tall or if it is over 11 uh, metres tall, uh, then the Act uh, applies. But the key to answering this question about commercial tenants is the concept of the qualifying lease. Now, you remember it has to be a single dwelling. So straight away we see that commercial tenants are all but ruled out um, of, of the protection of the act the one place where commercial tenants may have some protection is in a situation where the paragraph two type of landlord exists now one of the sets of regulations uh, uh, and i don't know if it's still in force or not, one of the sets of regulations, um, the Building Safety Leasehold Protection England regulations, specifically and expressly states by paragraph 10 uh, that uh, paragraph 2 of Schedule 8 of the Act, which states that no service charge is payable uh, uh, under a, a lease, uh, no service shall appell under a non-residential lease in a relevant building where the conditions set out in paragraph 2.2 two of the Act are met. And just to remind you, paragraph 2.2, two, no service charge is payable under the lease in respect of a relevant measure relating to a relevant defect if a relevant landlord, A, is responsible for the relevant defect, so basically if they built the building or if they undertook the repairs um, which caused the defect, or, and here's this concept again, 
is associated with a person responsible for the relevant defect. So it seems to me the way that the Act is drafted at present, uh, commercial tenants only recourse is if the landlord themselves were responsible for the defect or are associated. And if they are, then and the building qualifies, then they can uh, uh, use the protection of the Act to avoid their service charge. So that's that question. The second question um, is from Sean uh, Hackett um, and sets out in some detail um, uh, the point. And the point is this, what happens where you have a freeholder who then sublets to a head tenant who then underlets to various individuals? Well, um, obviously it depends on the actual makeup uh, of uh, the lease. Um, and where the re respective uh, liabilities and responsibilities lie. Um, but assuming the freeholder maintains the obligation for, say, cladding, um, then the freeholder will have a right, usually, uh, under the head lease, to recover from the head tenant that service charge. And because the head tenant is not a qualifying lessee, because it's not a, a single dwelling, uh, then the head tenant will have to pay. That is what the contract says. Uh, the head tenant, on the other hand, um, will uh, or may have an obligation uh, to charge back to the under tenants. But the under tenants, if they are qualifying lessees, uh, and I notice Sean talks about um, the under tenants being comprised of owner occupiers and non occupying investors. So the question is are they or are they not qualifying lessees? those who are qualifying lessees will be able to avoid the service charge to the head tenant, um, but the head tenant will not in turn be able to avoid paying that to the freeholder. Where it becomes a little more complex is, uh, as Simon uh, was discussing, uh, remediation orders and recovering amounts from other landlords. Now, I'm not going to go into the various circumstances uh, of these, not least because these regulations are subject to uh, challenge, um, but um, there are uh, a set of circumstances whereby uh, if the landlord is of the type set out in paragraph two or paragraph three of schedule eight, then the, la the intermediate landlord or whoever it is is paying can attempt to recover from them by way of a remediation order. But the key to note is that is a separate regime. We have one regime that prevents tenants having to pay, and we have the contractual mechanism that says who will have to pay, and a further mechanism whereby someone who has to pay can look to someone else to recover those costs. Um, Simon, do you, do you want to add anything to those two scenarios? Uh, no, I don't, principally because I've been <laughs> looking through some of the other questions. Oh, There's a lot, lo lots of good questions here. Um, shall I there, just whisper through a, a couple? A bit of a theme uh, about um, your... Uh, um, very complex point about whether or not there's retrospective uh, effect and what people should yeah. do. Um, I don't yeah. know if you're feeling brave enough to actually tell landlords or tenants what they should do in those circumstances, uh, as opposed to simply highlighting that it is an unresolved take, issue. Take some advice from council. Um, the <laughs> the um, so there's a few a few questions here. Service charges that have been uh, this is one from James Humphrey. Service charge demands have been paid. Should landlords therefore be issuing credits or refunds to leaseholders? There's conflicting government guidance notes on this, which is unhelpful. Um, I agree, it's unhelpful. Um, and uh, Rebecca quite rightly notes the explanatory notes to the Building Safety Act suggesting outstanding invoices. Um, are void and should be disregarded and does that change my view and the answer is no it doesn't change my view because i don't think the explanatory notes really give us the answer if the government wanted it to be retrospective then it needs to include that in the drafting so um whilst it's always relevant to construing an act uh what uh, parliament's intention was uh if you can't read it that way you can't read it that way so it's, it's going to have to be uh litigated and um yeah, I'm not going to uh, be brave enough to tell people they should or should not do one way 
or the other, but I do encourage uh, people to, someone to be brave enough to go out and litigate it so we know the answer. And um, certainly I've been advising on this point uh, quite a bit since uh, the uh, act came in, in in April, but we don't, we don't know the answer. There are good arguments, uh, good arguments both ways. We know the government asserts it's retrospective, but I think that raises an awful lot of questions. Um, what else was so there? There was a question about whether um, applications for remediation orders, remediation contribution orders can be issued in the upper tribunal. I don't think they can. Uh, you'd have to issue in the FTT. If you think there's a good reason once you've issued in the FTT why the upper tribunal can, should hear it, the FTT rules provide for it to then be pushed up to the upper tribunal. But I think it's unlikely unless you've got a particularly compelling case that the FTT is going to exceed to a request that it get transferred to the upper tribunal unless you've got the perfect best case. Uh, so no, you need to start in the FTT. Um, yeah, it, it, it can, it's very difficult actually to persuade the FTT to move the case up to the upper tribunal. Um, I've been involved in several attempts in the last 12 months and they are quite reluctant. Sorry, Aaron, you, uh, you no, had no, one I, there, I think. I, I was just going to, to, to jump in and, and, and say I can deal with another one if, if you'd like. Um, uh, a question that's been asked, which I consider a quite an interesting uh, uh, point, is um, whether or not uh, a relevant defect um, would actually cover something that comes to the end of its uh, natural um, life. Um, uh, uh, and uh, I think the answer to that is not clear um, from the Act. Um, what is clear is that um, the concept of relevant works, which is one element of the relevant defect, is very broad because it's anything to do with the construction of the building. Um, the other thing to remember in terms of the natural life of something is, although the period has been extended it is only extended to 30 years so one would hope with modern construction um being as it is that that a lot of things would not uh, outlast their natural life within 30 years um, but of course the key point is whether or not it causes a building safety risk so um if we're talking about um uh, for example uh fire prevention infrastructure um, then I think there is a good chance um, that that you, as a tenant, you could raise an argument that you wouldn't have to pay for something even at the end of its um, natural life. Of course, there is a whole uh, load of jurisprudence in the dilapidations um, field um, about whether or not something can be a defect um, if it isn't actually uh, broken and what disrepair means. So I can see a lot of crossover from uh, case law there. Um, into uh, the litigation that is inevitably going to come um, from this, because at its heart, this is a way for someone who is contractually obliged to pay for something to avoid paying for it. That's what the, the Act does. Uh, and it is in everyone's interest, uh, if they are contractually obliged to pay for something, to try and avoid paying for it. Um, that's why uh, both Simon and, and myself, and, and I suspect quite a lot of you, will find ourselves uh, very busy with this Act for, for some time to come. There's, uh, there's a question here. Has there been any confirmation as to whether a hotel and its rooms constitute a dwelling for the purposes of the definition of a relevant building? I don't think they will. Um, hotels not going to be a relevant building in most instances. There's actually quite a lot of case law on what a um, what what is meant by a dwelling, um, and generally, uh, I'm summarising hugely. But I mean, if it's unless it's got its own sort of living space, its own, uh, I mean, it will have its own bathroom. It's unlikely to have its own cooking facilities, so on and so forth. I suspect it's probably not a a dwelling but there's the cases to look for on that point are all the ones around student accommodation because when you look at student accommodation generally the sort of the individual uh units uh where they've then got shared facilities are not dwellings but then where you have if you have a building that's all student accommodation it has the odd studio of contained studio flat suddenly it is a building with dwellings uh, so that's the place to look for the answer on that but a straight hotel usually is not going to be a dwelling I don't think. Um, there was an interesting question 
I can't quite see where it was, but this point about um, what if it's not really a service charge? It's, it's the Moorshead Mansions and DeMarco points, which is where instead of the service charges being payable under the lease, they were payable as a matter of company law under the uh, company's constitution. Thus, it's not a service charge because it's not some pay, sums payable under a lease. And all the leaseholders, because they're paying it in their capacity as uh, as uh, members of the company, don't have any of the protection in the Act. Um, I can't really see how the Building Safety Act changes that position um, because um, if you look at Schedule 8, it's dealing with it, whether costs are are relevant costs and whether whether they're payable. Um, I don't know if you, you've got any thoughts on that, Aaron, but um, it's pa paragraph 10, isn't it, where, where it provides that no service charge is payable under a lease, then no costs incurred in respect of that thing um, are to be regarded as relevant costs taken into account when determining the amount of the service charge. So I think if you're paying it under company law, Schedule 8 doesn't help you. Yeah, I think that that's absolutely right, because there's references to both a service charge as a defined concept and term of art and also a lease so yeah. how, how how do you um uh, avoid that uh, and it is something that um that i have wondered if if we are going to see effectively a new drafting regime come in where people seek to specifically avoid these uh, types of difficulties um by attempting ingenious drafting methods I, I, i'm not sure um, one question that that uh, has been asked uh, a couple of times uh, anonymously, um, and uh, I've certainly been approached when I've given talks on the BSA before about, is, is the concept of getting information out of people. Um, it, it is a very good question to which there is not a very good answer, I'm afraid. Um, it, it seems to be something that is floating in the ether that sooner or later, um, those drafting the regulations are going to get hold of um, and realise that it, it's all well and good uh, saying that the tenants can uh, sue uh, or, or, forgive me, the tenants can avoid service charge liabilities or bring applications in relation to a particular type of landlord. But how are they? How on earth are they supposed to be able to tell that? Um, uh, and uh, I'm afraid I, I, I can say no more than I simply agree with you that that, that, that is the information pro provisions are, are not almost fit for purpose, I, I, I think. I mean, I don't know, Sam, if there's anything you want to add to that, because it's a, it's a question I've been asked no. a few times. Yeah, I agree. It's a problem. I, I know a number of my clients have, have got at the moment. Um, it's unsatisfactory. And uh, yeah, <laughs> we can only hope, we can only hope the regulations will be amended or added to, to, um, to, to resolve it all. We'll have to come up with some ingenious ways of uh, compelling people to provide information, but I'm not sure what they are. Um, there's a question um, here, um, the situation where there's an RTM company with uh, funding secured under the Building Safety Act, um, uh, and the question is, well, it's a requirement of the funding that the recipient of the funding should have funds to deal with the non-cladding remediation works. Um, so to those of you who haven't dealt with these BSF applications, it's that there's a grant funding agreement and you have to warrant that you will have the money to complete the works, including the bits the BSF isn't going to uh, be able to cover. Uh, and that's a particular issue for parties like RTM companies and RMCs where they've got no income, no assets, they're not going to get a loan, they're not, you know, so they're having to warrant something without really knowing whether they're going to have the money. Um, and it says, with the leaseholder protections in place, the RCM company appears only to have two routes to secure the funding uh, in order to be able to draw down the cladding funding, and that's the remediation order, remediation contribution order route, or the landlord notice. Uh, is that correct in your view, please? Yes, it is. I think you, you, you serve notice on the landlord. If you've got BSF funding in principle, you should be able to get your pre-application um, funding, which is about 10% of the anticipated costs, that should give you enough funding to be able to get some reports to know what's wrong with the building and enough information to then be able to serve notice on the landlord and give the landlord notice um, of the amount you expect it to fund. And your other route is the, the RCO route. Uh, but yeah, I think that's the right approach, um, Charlotte. Yeah, I, I'm just going to uh, just add a little bit uh, uh, 
to that um, because we've we haven't really discussed uh, how uh, all of this uh, interacts with the building safety fund. I, I know, Simon, you mentioned uh, the pledge. Uh, certainly, um, I have currently um, a, a couple of remediation order cases that are, are just brewing um, where uh, the lack of legal enforceability of the pledge um, has become laughable um, because, of course, who judges whether or not the developers are in breach of their pledge? Well, the developers, based on the evidence that they choose to call. Um, so, uh, of course, the fact that um, we go back to my initial bad guys uh, uh, list, you know, the, the fact that the building uh, fund uh, will not pay if the pledge kicks in and the pledge will not pay if the developer uh, 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 draws its own evidence to say, well, it's not in breach of its pledge, um, does uh, uh, reinforce the necessity for uh, this act, uh, and perhaps an act, um, al although with its um, interesting drafting, perhaps an act that is specifically drafted to be as wide ranging as possible rather than narrow in its focus. Um, you might say it's the only way to get people to pay, uh, but but there we are. Um, I'll just quickly answer, um, there's a question from Emily Wellington about whether the Act applies to agricultural tenancies under the AHA 86 and the ATA. Uh, in theory, yes. Um, my experience of farm dwellings is, I don't recall many that are five stories high or 11 meters in height but in theory there is no express provision that says it doesn't apply it is after all expected to um uh, uh assist um all, all tenants so if if one were to have um a qualifying lease that was also an agricultural tenancy in theory it would apply There's a question here about the uh, whether there's any regulations to support the new Section 20D to the Landlord and Tenant Act um, mm. works of a prescribed description. Uh, as far as I know, there aren't any regulations yet, unless I've missed some new draft regulations that give us the answer. But of course, Section 20D in itself is not in force yet either. Yeah. Um, hence, a number of people still have applications for dispensation for uh, remediation works outstanding uh, because they seemingly still have to get dispensation because uh, Section 20D isn't in force and yet may not be able to recover the cost. It's a curious situation, so I can't help you on that, I don't think. Yeah, we we specifically um, didn't mention Section 20D in this talk because not only is it not in force, but there doesn't seem to be a huge amount of information about when it is going to come um, into force. So, um, uh, it, it, it's a very interesting, um, very interesting section because on the face of it, it obliges uh, landlords not only to seek uh, funding elsewhere, but to obtain it. Well, how, how long is that going to take and, and how long are they going to remain in breach for? And what is the, the level to which they have to try to obtain it? It's, it's uh, yes, a, a, more issues will arise if and when that does come into, um, into effect. Yeah, uh, don't maybe got time for one or two questions. I think we'll wrap up. There's a there's a question about defects that relate to a period outside the thirty year limit, um, and the remedy of that not being caught by the act. Yeah, that's right. That the the idea of the act was to extend what would have effectively been um, the common law limitation um, of six years. Um, there had to be a cutoff point at some point, otherwise it's pointless because um, how would you even know who was responsible? And 30 year was the arbitrary figure that was was chosen. And that's what's in the act. Hmm. Uh, the question here, are landlords not at risk of remediation contribution orders if refunds are not issued to leaseholders who have paid? So this is that sort of, you know, is it retrospective? I, it's an interesting one. I, I can't, I don't think, that's really what remediation contribution orders are intended to secure. If if refunds are to be paid, then presumably the answer is that you seek a determination of payability of something you've already paid, and then you get a refund in the usual way by uh, issuing an application in the county court to enforce it. Uh, you know, it's money paid by mistake. Uh, it's an interesting one because 
the laws changed was it a mistake there's lots of legal issues raised from that but i'm not sure that's really what remediation contribution orders are for but that's not to say uh someone won't give it a whirl uh, is there anything else we can quickly answer before we go there's lots of interesting ones here where i'm afraid i I'm semi-ignoring you because I need more time than I can on the hoof to think about it. And it's a good question. There's one yeah, about does the Building Safety Act cover lifts and hoists? And the answer is only if they present a building safety risk. Um, and I, I think that's very unlikely in most cases because it's how are they contributing to the spread of fire, unless it's a specific fire safety issue with the lift. Um, and uh, unless it's going to drop to the ground and thus therefore constitute a collapse of part of the building. I, I just, I think general safety issues with lifts are just not covered. Yeah, um, and uh, uh, there is one question uh, uh, about, um, from Jean Jones, uh, about whether or not, when about when calculating contribution condition, is N the sum of reversions owned of any height or is it reversions uh, over 11 meters uh, my reading of the uh, uh, act is, is it's of any height um, this is simply an arbitrary way of calculating a wealth cap uh, the policy behind this was that if a landlord is in a position where it can pay then someone has to pay so we'll make them pay um, uh, so then it, well how does one decide whether that landlord is above the wealth cap that is arbitrarily going to be put on them uh, and this is what we've come up with so it was considered that the number of reversions that they had or their associate company had would be a good way of judging whether they were worth more or less than this as i say totally arbitrary cap that's been put in because someone's got to pay and it may as well be someone with some money it really is as simple as that i'm afraid all right, I think it's uh, it's twelve thirty, so we better wrap things wrap things up. But thank you, everyone. There's some really great questions. I'm sorry we haven't got to all of them. Um, there are always going to be huge numbers of questions on this topic, and maybe we need to do a, a part two talk at some point, um, especially if Section Twenty D comes into force. And uh, you know, let's see where we are in uh, three to six months' time. But uh, good luck, everyone, dealing with all these cases. And thank you for coming. Thank you.